All right. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Right on. Okay. Uh, so a little bit of housekeeping and then we'll go into, um, into the lectures. Um, so uh, here's the calendar and we are here. Um, so that means this week we have uh, a tutorial to do. So that's already been released. Um, you guys have had access to it for a while. Um, so watch the video, do the tutorial, and that is due by next Monday at midnight. Um, other than that, it's going to be sort of a light week, but we do have our assignment coming up on the 20th. Um, and next week's another tutorial. And then after that, the second quiz. So, uh, so the second quiz will be a little bit different, but not too different. It'll, it'll still be um, a see you learn quiz, but um, you'll be writing sort of long answers, essays, and you'll have the option of of uploading, um, uh, writing your, your answer down on paper and then uh, either scanning it somehow or taking a picture and then uploading it. Um, so will there be a second practice quiz? Yep, there will definitely be a second practice quiz, um, probably coming out next week or maybe this week if I get, uh, if I get caught up on everything, which I am pretty much caught up on a lot of stuff. So, um, yeah, <laughs> you got confused between inverse and converse. Yeah, me too. So let's see here. <clears throat> Inverse, I got them wrong, and so I gave everyone the marks for those questions um, after reducing the weight a little bit to, uh, you know, sort of make it more fair. Um, yeah, I, I tend to have to look these things up, and if I don't look them up, I, I do pay the price for it. So let's see, inverse is... Uh, you want to save your answers? Yeah. So the tutorial, if you want to save our answers for the tutorial quiz, but not submit it, do we just close the window for the quiz? Yes, I think that should work. Um, although I've never written these things. So this is all kind of new to us. So if you do that and there's a problem, just let me know and we'll, uh, we'll figure it out. But I, I'm pretty sure uh, the tutorial stays open for the entire time. So you can come back to it, do a little bit here, come back to it, do a little bit more, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, your answer should be saved. That's the way I tried to set it up, but if it's not set up that way, then I would please tell me and, and I'll uh, do my best to fix it. Um, okay, inverse and converse. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll cover that briefly before we, we start. Um, so yeah, this week tutorial two and then uh, a second quiz in a couple weeks. And um, is there any questions on, um, or any other questions, any on the material or, <laughs> yeah. It should work. Is the second quiz timed? Yeah, so that's that's what I'm going for. It's going to be the same sort of format. Um, the only difference is it won't be multiple choice. It'll be long answers, so you'll have to get them. It'll you have to wait. It'll have to be marked by a TA. Other than that, it's going to be uh, the same format as as the quiz that you've had already. You're going to take it through CU Learn. You'll have three days to do it. When you open it, um, then you'll have 60 minutes to finish it. Um, and it'll be three questions. Yeah. So yes, you have the option of doing that and I'll have sort of, um, so you'll be doing proofs and proofs are very difficult to do multiple choice. Um, but it is open book. So you'll have, uh, you'll know the names of each of the, uh, inference rules and logical equivalences. Um, yeah, you'll have the option of typing things or you also have the option of writing them on a piece of paper taking a, a picture with your phone or, or your camera, whatever you have, and then uploading it. Um, just make sure that if you do that, that it's clear. Um, you know, once you've uploaded it, if we can't understand what, if we can't see it and understand what's there, then that's, you know, there's nothing we can do at that point. Um, so yeah, if, if you're going to do that, make sure that you have a way to, you know, make sure you, you have a way to get your file to see you learn. Um, otherwise, you can type things in and um, uh, yeah, next week or some later this week, I will have more detail on how you want to do this. Um, so 
instead of um, typing in these these math things that are actually quite difficult, you can do it, but uh, you also have the option of just using English. So you can use and instead of the uh, instead of the uh, upside down wedge, or you can use or and not instead of the negation. So we'll, I'll set up a glossary of things that you can use. Um, and the proofs are going to be simple, so so don't worry about you know it won't be uh, it won't be huge long proofs like the the types that we've seen, but um, yeah, uh, that's just to give you a, an overhead uh, overview. Um, uh, I will be coming out with a lot more details uh, way in advance of the quiz. Um, I should have the second. Um, yeah, actually the uh, the practice quiz is just about done, but uh, yeah, I just haven't. Uh, I guess I, I could release it early for you guys. So, um, any other questions? Okay, so let's look quickly at inverse and converse. Um, let's see here. So if I have an implication, um, P implies Q. Let's see if I can get this correct this time. So the inverse, so I got it backwards. The inverse is, I believe, not P implies not Q. Can anybody confirm this? Because I don't have my notes in front of me. But uh, I'm pretty sure that's the case. And then the converse is uh, Q implies P. Actually, I can Google it as well. It should be easier than looking through my notes. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, so that's it, yeah. And I mixed it up and that's totally my, uh, I didn't uh, I didn't take the time to confirm, I just sort of, you know, was pretty sure and I, it turns out I was wrong. Um, so yeah, that's the, uh, the inverse and converse. And since it is open book, uh, the quizzes and whatnot, I do recommend having your book open, um, having your notes ready and then, uh, so that you can just simply look these things up. Like I said, I frequently have to look these up, the rules, although, you know, the more you use them, the less you have to look them up, but um, that's not an unusual thing. And if I was, if this wasn't a, an open book quiz, then I would generally speaking, give you the rules. Uh, so for reference. Um, okay, so yeah, this is uh, implication. This is inverse. And this is converse. And then of course, contrapositive would be uh, not Q implies not P. All right. And yeah, you guys have been catching a lot of my mistakes, uh, typos, mistakes, uh, what have you, which is a little bit embarrassing, but very, very good actually, because uh, it shows that you're really uh, grasping the material. Um, and I'm bound to make mistakes. Um, I'm producing a lot of material, so it's there's going to be typos. There's going to be there's going to be things that aren't quite as clear as they should be. Um, by all means, please please bring it up. It helps me a lot, and uh, and it helps you guys as well. So and and I'm really happy to see you guys uh, catching those things. That's that that says a lot for you. Um, okay. Uh, any other questions? Did I have anything else to cover? I think that's it. Not much housekeeping today. Um, other than, I mean, I hope everybody's keeping safe and, uh, good news is that uh, things are going to start opening this Friday, which is, I mean, I know myself, I'm already starting to push the boundaries of this social distancing stuff because it's difficult. So, uh, you know, Friday, hopefully we get a little bit of, of normalcy back, but, uh, Anyway, hopefully you guys are, are keeping well and uh, yeah, maybe things will go back to normal sooner rather than later. Um, okay. So if there's no other questions, then I will get to, actually, I don't need to do this. I will get to our lesson. So we're going to do, uh, 
proof by induction and uh, sequences and sums. And it depends on how fast these go, on whether, um, how far we get. I'm not sure. Um, these, all these lessons have been going faster than I expect, expected, which is sort of partially due to the medium where I'm using slides and uh, instead of the chalkboard like I usually do. But uh, that's not a bad thing necessarily. Uh, the less time we, if we spend a little bit less time sitting on Zoom, um, I don't see that as a bad thing. Um, so last week, arguing with quantified predicates. So that's here, instantiation and generalization and the English equivalents. So that's for all and there exists. And that's just a way of, of sort of specifying things out of our universe of discourse that we want to argue about and specifying, you know, either all of them or some of them um, in, in these specific instances. Um, so we talked about that and then we talked about formal proof methods. So we talked about direct proof, which is a simple implication. I have some premises or, or set of premises and they imply some conclusion. Um, and we talked, of course, about, uh, yeah, before that we talked about, you know, valid uh, arguments and uh, sound arguments and, and sort of the things that go into making these proofs. And then we went over uh, some proof strategies. So there's a simple implication where you just assume that the, uh, the direct proof, I assume that the premise holds, and then I just use that um, in rules of inference as facts. Uh, assumption and then I you know get down to some conclusion um, C uh, so that hopefully uh, yeah and maybe this would be p1 p2 uh, and then so you've logically argued that these things imply our conclusion um, and then we saw some examples of indirect proofs uh, so we can use the contrapositive which is is logically equivalent to our implication or any logically equivalent expression could also be thought of as an indirect proof. Um, we looked at contradiction, so we assume that the um, we assume that whatever we're trying to prove. So if we're trying to prove an implication, we assume it's false. Uh, and then, while we're trying to prove that that's the case, uh, we run into some contradiction. Um, and we looked at other proofs that. These we'll see a little bit less of, but uh, vacuous proof and biconditional proof we'll probably see. Uh, case analysis comes up a lot. This is, if you can't think of a clever proof, you can always just do, uh, do a proof for every single item. Um, existence proofs, et cetera, et cetera. So that's sort of a recap of what we did last week. Um, this week, uh, introduction, to proof, introduction to proof by induction. So. Uh, this is just another type of proof, but it's uh, it deserves its own lecture. Um, so, and a lot of people have trouble with it. So, hopefully, uh, if you find yourself having trouble, don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, so, proof by induction is if I want to prove for all x p of x, then how do I do that? Um, so, you can prove it if you prove it for. We saw how you could prove for an arbitrary item. Um, and then use uh, universal generalization uh, to prove for all. But uh, this is going to be a, just another strategy that we can use. So we're going to look at uh, what types of things we can prove by induction. We're going to look at strong and weak induction. And then we're going to look at some examples. So uh, induction is the, uh, the last two um, questions on your uh, second assignment. So uh, these will... Uh, yeah, the, the examples that we look at will sort of uh, be directly related to the things that you're trying to prove on your assignments. Um, and then if we, assuming we get through all that, we'll look at the sequences and sums. Um, so we're gonna look at the series and geometrics, geometric and arithmetic series. Um, so we'll see exactly what that is, but it's, uh, you know, in a sense, it's things like this, where I say one plus two plus four plus eight. So that's a sum. Uh, you could say that's a series, and if I add them all up, then that's the sum is uh, is the answer to to that summation. Um, so I evaluate that series. Is that's the sum? Uh, we'll look at closed forms for the sum. So here it's fairly easy to prove. But what if this was numbers one through a million? Um, then this is actually a, a lot more difficult to do uh, just by adding them up. So 
closed forms are just formulas that are, are simpler and that can show what these sum to. Uh, we're gonna look at sigma notation. So that's a way to express these sums and then uh, manipulating uh, sigma expressions, adding, subtracting. Anyway, uh, you'll get the idea when we get to it. <clears throat> okay, so induction, that's the first, uh, the first topic. So how do we prove the following claim? So for all n, that's of the natural numbers, um, so one plus two plus three, all the way up to n is equal to n times n plus one over two. So that's true, but how would we prove that? Or in general, uh, how do we prove universal conditions, right? So this for all x, p of x sort of thing. Uh, this is sort of the, the type of problem that we're looking at. Um, so there's a few different proofs, uh, but one is easily generalizable, which means uh, it will work on a wide range of problems. <clears throat> um, so I don't know if you guys have done programming yet, but if you have, uh, I don't know if you've done recursion yet, but if you have, then this is a recursive program. And if you haven't, then, uh, you know, hopefully one of the other examples and analogies will, will help you to understand. But if we want to sum all the numbers from uh, one to some number, uh, in this case, it's I. Uh, so we have this recursive program. So um, if I is less than or equal to one, we just, uh, we know what the sum is, it's just the number itself. Um, but if it's something greater than that, then we can just add I and recursively call a uh, sum on I minus one. So that should add up, add all the numbers, uh, from one to I together. But how do we know that it works? Well, how we know is that basically we know it works for, it works for one because that's sort of a trivial case. Right? So that's these two lines here. And, uh, it's pretty clear that it works for that because all we do is return the number itself. Um, and then we could say, well, we know it works for two because if it works for two, if I is equal to two, then this is the sum of one, which we know works. And we can see that we've done this correctly. So then we know we've, that works for two. And since it works for two, then you can sort of say, well, it also works for three because we know that it works for two over here. And we can see that we've done this part correctly. All right. So, that's one analogy, one approach, one way to look at uh, what induction is. So let's try and do that sort of uh, recursive uh, idea uh, with this problem. So for all n in the natural numbers, if we sum them all up, it's equal to this n times n plus one over two. So let's try proving the easy base case when n is equal to zero. Um, so for n equal to zero, Sorry. Okay, so for n equal to zero, then we could write this expression as, well, it's zero is equal to uh, zero times zero plus one over two, which means that zero is equal to uh, zero times one, which is zero, and we'll divide it by two, which is also zero. So then it's, it's true, uh, true when n is equal to zero. Okay, so that's a start. So let's look at now, uh, what if for some k that's in the natural numbers, we, we could assume that this was true, or we knew that it was true, or whatever. <clears throat> um, so could we prove it for the next, the next highest value of k? So here it's from one, we're summing up from one to k, and here we're summing up from one to k plus one. And then, so this is, uh, if we substituted k for uh, k plus one, or k plus one for k, uh, then we end up with this expression. So this is sort of the equivalent thing, but for the next higher, higher value. So let's, let's try and prove that. So let p of n be the proposition that 
the sum of the numbers from one to n is equal to n times n plus one over two. Uh, so does p of k imply p of k plus one? So that's really what we want to prove. And we're going to prove that. Um, so using our, our, our proof styles, using a direct proof. So we could say one p of k, this is our assumption. Okay, and then uh, two, uh, this, is equivalent to uh, k times k plus one over two, right? So this is the definition of p of k. All right, is everybody still following? Is any questions? So now we want to sort of we want to take this expression, which we're assuming is true, and try and prove that this p of k is p of k plus one is true. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to add uh, k plus one to both sides. So we get one plus two plus k plus k plus one is equal to k over k plus one over two plus k plus one. And I'm uh, Yeah, I'm running out of, uh, let's move this over a bit. And this is just using um, two and math. So we add K plus one to both sides. Okay, so everybody's comfortable with that. So nothing complicated has happened so far. Um, so we can evaluate these sides now. So because we have this as a fact in our, you know, our knowledge base, um, we can take this and substitute uh, this guy in for that, right? So since we're assuming that that's true, uh, we can take this sum and write k times k plus one over two instead. And then we add this term in, so plus k plus one, and that's equal to, um, if we evaluate this out, so there's a little bit of algebra involved, but this ends up being uh, k squared plus three k plus two over two. All right, so that's three and some math. <clears throat> and uh, actually, no, so three, two, three, and math. Okay, any questions? So hopefully you can see sort of where we're going with this. Um, yeah. Actually, we don't even need this part. My apologies. One plus two plus, plus K plus K plus one. Um, five, one plus two plus, plus K plus K plus one is equal to, and if we factor this out, this is equal to K plus one, K plus two over two. So that's just again, four in math. And then, well, this is what we wanted to show, right? So we wanted to show this thing, which is equal to P of K plus one. And uh, here we've just shown it's true. So then we can say P of K plus one. This is five in the definition of P of K plus one. Okay, so now we've, we've shown that uh, P of k implies p of k plus one. So this is true. All right, good. Any questions on that proof? It's mainly algebra. So uh, hopefully you followed it. So now what have we shown? 
So we've shown that if it's true for P of K plus P of K, then it is true for P of K plus one. And we've also shown that it's true for the base case of zero. So now we can say, well, um, it's true for P of zero, then by one, it is true for P of one, right? Since we've shown that P of zero implies P of one. And if it's true for P of one, then by one, it is true for P of two, because we've shown that P of one implies P of two. Um, and if it's true for P of two, uh, then it's also true for P of three, et cetera, et cetera. So we've in essence shown that it's true for all of them just by showing, by showing two things. This base case where we show P of zero and this uh, what's called the inductive hypothesis. So, all right, so what are we trying to prove exactly using this algebra? So we wanted to, what we wanted to do is start at P to the K or P at K and then arrive. So we wanna show that if this is true, then this is true. That's what we were trying to show, right? So this is the thing we were trying to show. And to show that P of K plus one is true, well, this is, um, if we break down, so P of N is uh, one plus two plus up to N. So it's the proposition that this is equal to that. So if we substitute K plus one for N, then we get P K plus one, one plus two plus up to K plus one, and that's equal to k plus one for the n here, k plus one for the n here, plus one over two. So that's uh, k plus one. So this, if we show this is true, then we've shown that this is true since they're equivalent, okay? Hopefully, does that, uh, right, perfect. Okay, and so, yeah. So since we've shown it, and then you can kind of see here how you get this chain reaction of, well, it turns out that they're all true if we can show that it's true for the base case, and that if it, the, uh, you know, for any given value uh, implies that the value above it is true. So it's sort of like a domino proof, right? Um, so if we have a sequence of dominoes set up, I don't know if you guys are familiar with dominoes, but there are these little rectangular things and you set them up and then you push the first one over and then it knocks over the next one and it knocks over the next one and they all fall down and it looks really cool. Um, but this proof is similar to that, right? So we're saying that, well, if the domino before me falls, then I will fall and uh, we're all in a sequence and the first domino falls. So somebody pushes the first one over, which means that they're all going down. Okay, so the proof is similar to that. I'm just saying that, yeah, the guy behind me is going to knock me down if he falls. And, you know, and the same is true for him and the guy before. So conclusion is they all fall down. <clears throat> all right. And so sort of formally <clears throat> how we can prove this for all things. So this in proof by induction is really hiding all of this. So if we go back to how we prove things, um, we have our uh, basis of knowledge and we have our starting facts, which is the base case, the basis step. Um, so there's a couple different words for those. Uh, no, uh, although integers are sort of the easiest starting place. So there's K and K plus one, yeah. So we're gonna show you a couple examples where we're applying it on things that, I mean, it does usually wind up all being math, but it, there is a little bit of flexibility in how you can use it. Um, and we're gonna see strong induction is, allows you even more flexibility. This is actually weak induction. Um, but our, our facts, so this one we've proven because it's easy to prove. So P of one, the basis step or base case, it's a couple different uh, phrasings for these things that are, and they're both the same. 
And then we show for all of k in the natural numbers, p of k implies p of k plus one. That's the inductive step, or uh, could also call it the inductive hypothesis because it's a hypothesis because it's, well, we're assuming that it's true and then if to try and prove that it's true. So we don't know that it's true, but if we can assume P of K and prove, prove P of K plus one, then our hypothesis is correct, so to speak. And then, so using these two rules, um, we can do universal instantiation. So that's this one um, with one and two, and then use, since we have one and we have this implication, uh, we can conclude P of two using uh, modus ponens right here. Right, and then we can use universal instantiation again to get this P of two implies P of three. Um, and then we can conclude P of three uh, because P of two is true. And that means P of three is true. And then at the end, we can just use conjunction on all of the things that we've proven are true. Uh, there's some, you know, infinite number here. But it does work. Um, and so, you know, uh, so this is what, if we, if we wrote it all out formula for, sorry, sorry, we wrote it all out formally, this is what it would look like. Um, but we use induction not only as a simpler proof, but also as sort of a, a short form for all of this. So we don't have to write it all out. And in the end, we can conclude for all of n, p of n. Okay. Any questions on that part? So we are gonna do uh, a, a few more examples, actually quite a few more examples, um, because a lot, of, a lot of people have trouble with this and it's sort of easy to see why. It's a lot of abstract and abstraction there. Okay, so a proof by induction has two components, uh, the basis step or base case and the inductive step or inductive hypothesis. And basically, those are the two things you need. So anytime you do a proof by in induction, you should, you should be writing this base case, decide what your base case is, maybe it's P of zero or something, and prove that that's true. And then your inductive case you would show something like this. All right, and these, so I, I'm doing K implies K plus one. I can do J implies J plus one. I could do J minus one implies J, as long as these are sort of, for weak induction, as long as these are in sequence. Yeah, and so yeah, exactly what I wrote up here. Um, I prove P for some minimum element more accurate to put base case here because it's not necessarily the minimum element and then uh, and then we prove this okay so for an example we're going to prove the sum of the first n positive odd integers equals n squared um, so what does that mean that means something like this uh, so if we take n equal to one uh, that's equal to uh, one squared. So that's uh, n equal to two, it's one plus three, uh, sorry, one squared, it's odd. I'm doing a different odd integers. So that's the first odd integer. This is the first and second odd integers. Um, and that's equal to two squared equal to four. So it's true for n equal to two n equal to three, we have one plus three plus five equals three squared, which is nine, so which is also true. So it's true for all of those, for n equal to one, n equal to two, n equal to three, uh, et cetera. So we can sort of verify uh, by hand for a lot of small numbers, um, but this is what we mean when we say the sum of the first n positive odd integers is equal to n squared. Okay, so now let's prove it. So basis step P of one is true. And we've proven that uh, above. We've actually proven more than that, but that's, that's sufficient. So now we want to do the inductive step.
So P of K implies P of K plus one. So we're gonna start with P of K and show that, that uh, we can use that sort of to build P of K plus one. So P of K is our assumption. And that means uh, you know, one plus three plus five up to two K minus one equals K squared. All right, so this is really how we frame. Um, so the first um, odd number would be two times one minus one, which is one. The second odd number would be two times two minus one, which is three. Yeah, so actually the, uh, well, we have these slides with the written note posted. Actually, if you go on to, uh, it, it should be both on CU Learn and on uh, Discord. Um, so on Discord, it'll be under resources. And it actually has the completed um, version of this. Although, you know, I may make small changes, but uh, yeah, you don't need, uh, they're already completed and on both CU Learn and Discord. Um, I like running through it and writing it out because that way, it's, it's sort of more organic and hopefully gives people a better idea of how to do them than just reading them. Uh, so that's the idea behind it. Um, okay. So this is the definition of P of K. Any other questions uh, before I move on here? <clears throat> okay, and then Similar to the last proof we did, we can just add the next. So we want to pr prove this P of K plus one. So we can add uh, the next odd term, which is two K plus one. And that's equal to K squared plus two K plus one. So what we're doing is uh, taking two and math and which is adding 2k plus 1 to both sides. OK. Now we can, uh, so if we write this out again, 1 plus 3 plus 5 up to 2k plus 1. Um, if we factor this out, we can get to uh, k plus 1 times k plus 1, k plus 1 squared. So this is, this is exactly the definition of p of k plus 1, right? Uh, well, not so much these middle guys, but... And that's four and definition of P K plus one. Okay, so with simple algebra, we use, we use our assumption to build up uh, the thing that we want to prove. Uh, and there's more ways, these are the very, very simple ones. There's more clever ways to go about it. Um, but these are, uh, you know, a good starting place. All right. Any questions on that? So we've essentially shown that this is true, that the sum of the first n positive in odd integers is equal to n squared for all uh, of n greater than uh, all positive n. You always add the next term in the sequence to both sides. It's, it's usually a good starting place, um, although it's, there are, of course, um, harder inductive questions that it takes, uh, you have to be a little more clever on how you do it. Uh, sometimes you have to, you know, factor things out or whatever. These are, these are very simple. But in general, that's the spirit of the thing that you want to do. You want to try and take whatever is defined by this PK, and you want to try and build PK plus one. Okay. Right. Any other questions? Okay, so let's go to, let's see some different things we can prove. So we've shown 
equalities, we can also use it to prove inequalities. We can show that n is less than 2 to the power n for all positive integers of n. So that's sort of something trivial, but and it should be sort of clear that that's true, but uh, we can actually prove it. So again, we start with the basis step. So n is equal to 1. So we want all positive integers. So we'll take the, the least one of those. And that means 1 less than 2 to the power 1, uh, which is true. So that's 1 being less than 2, which is true. So now our inductive step. And it's very, you know, very formulaic in how you in how you lay it out. Um, usually the clever stuff comes, if there is any clever stuff to do, will come in the proof. Um, <clears throat> so here we have P K, that's our assumption. So we're assuming that K is less than two to the power K. So that's the definition. P of K. <clears throat> K plus one is less than two to the power K plus one. So we've added one to both sides. Um, and this is less than two to the K to the power of K plus one. Um, and we're not, of course, going to prove that. That should be sort of clear. And that's just an application of math. So now we have. 4 is k plus 1 is less than 2 to the power of k plus 1, um, which is just 3 in math. <clears throat> this should be 2 in math. And this is the definition of p k plus 1. OK, so here we did, uh, you know, it wasn't quite, it's a, we're using inequalities, so uh, it, was, it wasn't as straightforward as before, but it's still quite simple. Um, so we can do inequalities like that. Good. Questions? All right. So we can use it on other types of problems. It says not strictly math. Um, it does tend to revolve a lot around numbers. But let's say there's an ancient courtyard with a statue, which is one meter square. So we have this statue. Uh, and I'm going to go over this very informally. Um, uh, I'm not going to write down all the, the facts or whatever. We're just going to sort of go through it. We're going to use the base, the basis step and the inductive step, but I'm going to do this a little more informally. So we have the statue. It's a one meter squared. And we have a tiler that only has L-shaped tiles. So these are three square meters, and they look something like this. Um, if you can imagine that. These are all squares. So that's three meters squared. Um, so he claims he could tile any square courtyard whose length, side length is a factor of two meters long uh, and include the statue. So then for a base case or basis step, We could just use, we could say, well, just a statue by itself, because that is uh, the side lengths are a power of two. They're, in fact, two to the zero meters and two to the zero meters. Um, but we could take it a step further even than that. And we can show that we could take a single tile, put the statue here, and now this is two meters by two meters squared. So um, the base, the basis step holds. Um, we can actually tile very small uh, courtyards uh, and include this, this statue. Okay, so then let's go to our inductive step. And so we're going to assume we can tile a courtyard of two to the k meters by two to the k meters. 
with one square missing for the statue. Okay, so that looks something like this. Um, our inductive hypothesis, this is two to the K meters, two to the K meters, and somewhere in here we have our statue. And we're gonna assume we can do that. And then we're gonna prove that we can do it for uh, two to the K plus one meter squared. So if we look at what that looks like. It's basically four of those smaller guys. Um, so this is uh, two to the K plus one. And these are uh, this length here, two to the K. Two to the K and, and twice two to the K is of course two to the K plus one. So we're using the idea that we can do this and show that we can do this guy. Uh, and so what we do is we of course put the statue right here. Um, and then we put a single tile that covers one space in each of the other squares. And so now our inductive hypothesis, by our inductive hypothesis, we can do uh, this guy here, this guy here, this guy here, and this guy here, because they are two to the K by two to the K with one square missing, right? So then we can tile any size of courtyard uh, using this, uh, this technique, right? So that's sort of informally. Did uh, everybody follow or any questions on that? Yeah, so that's a little bit off the beaten path, I guess. Okay. So that's sort of the examples that we're going to look at for weak induction. Uh, there's a much longer weak induction example, but we're going to do that at the end of, uh, of this section. And that sort of directly relates to, uh, to what you're gonna do on the assignment. Uh, but let's look at strong induction. So strong and weak induction. Uh, so weak induction is what we're looking at where we say um, P, to, P to the K implies P to the K plus one. Um, for strong induction, we can say that any value uh, less than or equal to K implies P to the K plus one. Um, so weak induction, we assume holds for the kth step and strong induction, we assume holds for all previous step, steps. So what's the difference? Um, or is there a difference? Well, what do we know about weak induction? If we know that, if we're assuming P of K is true, can we assume that P to K minus one is true also? Or P K minus two? I mean, if this is true, then we can sort of assume that these must have been true also in order to get up to P of K, right? By our inductive hypothesis, we can assume they're all true. So that's in a sense what we do with this strong induction. So really, they're the same thing, um, just taken a step further. So the weak inductive hypothesis implies the strong inductive hypothesis, so to speak. And uh, so if P K is true, then all of the ones before it, we can assume were also true because if P of K implies P of K plus one, then um, all of these must've been true all the way down the line, <clears throat> right? Sort of like that domino effect. If I've fallen over, then I, I know not just the guy before me has fallen over, but I also know that everybody before him has fallen over as well, right? So that's sort of what this strong inductive hypothesis is. So we can sometimes use that to, to be more clever about how we prove things. So this is, uh, this was our, uh, this is weak induction here. And this is sort of, when we do the, uh, the proofs, this is sort of the thing that we're hiding. This is our formal steps that we go through. Um, and then in the end, we do the conjunction. So we just do uh, P1 implies P2. And then, so we can declare P of two is true. And then P of two implies P of three, et cetera, et cetera. For strong induction, 
um, we keep all of the previous steps together to imply the next step, right? So P plus one or P to one and P to the two imply P to the three. And then uh, P to the three and then at the end, um, well, you don't even really need the, uh, uh, no, you do need the, the conjunction, but you can do, uh, you don't need all of these steps. You just need the last two. <clears throat> all right. So the difference is really this. Our inductive hypothesis is that we're assuming all of the previous steps are true, and we're going to use that to prove uh, PK plus one. So let's look at an example of that. Or first, any questions on that? Right. So proof by strong induction. Every natural number is the product of primes. So prime numbers, if you recall, uh, prime numbers, only divisors are one in itself. Divisible <clears throat> by one and itself. And so, Every natural number is a product of prime numbers. So that's our claim. So for our basis step, n equal to two, well, two is a prime number. One is trivial, of course, so we'll start at two. Um, so therefore, two is a product of primes, right? Sort of vacuously true. <clears throat> then our inductive hypothesis. So we're gonna say that for all of i between two and k, that p of i implies p of k plus one. Okay, so that's the power of this strong induction is that uh, we have a lot more flexibility in choosing which, which one we want to use here. So now if k plus one is prime, then uh, this is tri trivially true, right? Um, so if k plus one is prime, then it's the product of itself, so to speak. Um, so it is the product of primes. Um, so we don't have to prove that because it's already trivially true. So we're going to assume that k plus one is not prime. All right, so now we have our, our facts. So our assumption is our inductive hypothesis, so to speak, is the, that p of i is true for all of i uh, less than or equal to k and greater than or equal to two. Um, and we know the two that k, k plus one is not prime by assumption. Okay. So if k plus one is not prime, we can write k plus one as the product of two, two numbers. Um, for one less than a, b uh, less than k plus one, right? And this is sort of the, the definition of not prime. And now we have what we have here are A and B, which are two numbers that are somewhere between, uh, they're greater than one and less than K plus one. So they fall somewhere in this range here. So two less than or equal to I, less than or equal to K. So what that means is that those two things um, are the product of primes by induction. All right, so we can write, uh, so that's, P of A is true and P of B is true. Or let's actually separate these, save ourselves some headaches. <clears throat> these are by our uh, inductive hypothesis. Which is uh, line number one. <clears throat> okay, so then that means that we can write A as the product of primes, so A1, A2, up to AN, where AI equals a prime number. And we can similarly write B as a product of primes. So if I And uh, bi equals a prime number for some for some i. I should use actually maybe j here instead of i.
Okay, so that means um, eight, and this is just the definition of P of A. So then eight, I can take three here and say K plus one is equal to A1, A2, A N times B1, B2, Bn, uh, that's three, six, seven, and math. So what that means is K plus one is the product of primes. So since all of these numbers are prime numbers, And that's, uh, yeah. So we can declare then that uh, P of K plus one is true um, by definition of P of K plus one. <clears throat> okay, so uh, questions on that? P of A and P of B again, sure. Um, so here, because k plus one is not prime, so if we look at line three here, we know that k plus one is not prime, so we can write it as the, the product of two numbers that are not one and not itself. And what that means is, another way of writing that is two is less than or equal to a is less than or equal to k, and two is less than or equal to b is less than or equal to k. That's probably a better way of writing it. Yeah, so yeah, so then we can apply this first fact, our inductive hypothesis, and uh, and we can assume those things are true because, um, yeah, because that's one of our facts that we've assumed. Okay, any other questions? Okay. Uh, Right, so one more strong inductive argument, and then uh, I think we'll take take the break before we get to our last, because uh, the last uh, proof by induction example is kind of long. So um, we'll come back refreshed, and then and then go, go through it, and then maybe start on uh, summations and see how far we get. Um, so let's prove, and this is from actually the notes, but let's prove that. Uh, actually from the discrete study center. So we will prove that every amount of postage greater than or equal to 12 cents can be formed using four cents and five cents stamps. So if you ever had to mail something, um, well, I don't know, these days uh, Amazon provides these, uh, these prepaid postages, but um, you can also still buy stamps and then uh, put the right amount of stamps on a package and that shows that you've paid for the postage. Um, I don't know if they do that that much anymore. <clears throat> but that, that used to be the way they do things. So, um, so if we want to mail something and we want to, we only have four and five cent stamps and we want to be able to make any price. So we want to say that for all n greater than or equal to 12 cents, um, that n cents can be formed by using a four cent stamps and b five cent stamps for a greater than or equal to zero and b greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so is the, is the question clear? Is there any questions on what we're trying to prove? Okay, so we're gonna let P of N be the proposition that N cents is equal to A four cent stamps and B five cent stamps and A is greater than or equal to zero and B is greater than or equal to zero. This should actually be for all N greater than or equal to 12. <clears throat> Okay, so now to do strong induction, um, we actually have to do four base cases, and we're gonna I'm going to explain why um, in a minute. But for for now, we'll just go through them. So we're going to start with p of twelve, which is well, if we did three times four cents plus zero times five cents, so yes, we can do twelve. 
um, P13. So that's two times four cents plus one times five cents. So yeah, we can, we can make 13 cents using uh, two and four cent stamps or five, four and five cent stamps. P14, one times four cents plus two times five cents. P15 equals zero of four cents plus three times five cents. So that seems like maybe a little bit of extra work, but we've what we've done is we've made our life easier because we're we're now allowing ourselves to use strong induction. So our inductive hypothesis is now that uh, for all j less than k, p of j implies p of k, and for k greater than or equal to 16, since we've already done up to 15. And notice I've changed up the notation. This was not on purpose, but um, it's still not incorrect. Uh, so don't be confused by the fact that I used k here instead of k plus 1. <clears throat> These are all just variables. So I can write it like this. Uh, yeah, would it be acceptable to have the inductive hypothesis be P of K minus four um, implies P of K plus one for a strong inductive hypothesis, induction proof? Yes, if you can make that work, you could definitely do it. And that is uh, sort of what we're going for here. Um, so one, um, our inductive hypothesis is for all of j less than k, p of j. So this is our assumption. And then, so we're going to do, um, yeah, and we're gonna, uh, p of k minus four. And we're going to do this by a uh, universal generalization. Or sorry, instantiation. All right, so for, since we can declare this is valid for all of J less than K, um, we're going to go for K minus four, because then we can simply uh, use a four cent stamp right, to, to make P of K. Um, so P of K minus four is, the definition is that I have K minus four cents is equal to A times four cents plus B times four cents. And A is greater than or equal to zero and B is greater than or equal to zero, right? And this is just the definition of P of K minus one or P of K minus four, sorry. Ah, times five, yes, thank you. Okay, um, and then we can do, so we can get rid of these two terms here just by using simplification, so uh, K cents minus four cents equals A times four cents plus B times five cents. And that's just three in simplification. All right. Um, and then we're just gonna do some simple math by adding four cents to each side. So K cents minus four cents plus four cents. So this represents the four cent stamp. A times four cents plus B times five cents uh, plus four cents. And that's four and math, uh, add four cents to each side. six we can simplify that so these two cancel out so now we have k cents is equal to and we can say a plus one times four cents plus b times five cents right 
So we've showed basically that we can make this K sense out of uh, one extra four cents stamp. Okay, everybody still any questions so far? This is just five in math. And then we can let a prime equal a minus one. And then, so we know that a is greater than or equal to zero. That's three simplification. And then that implies that a prime is greater than or equal to zero. That's simply seven in math. <clears throat> Um, nine, we know that B is greater than or equal to zero. That's three simplification. And we have this 10 K cents equals A prime times four cents plus B times five cents. Ah, yes, sorry, A plus one. Right, you're right. <clears throat> All right, yeah, good. Thanks, thanks, for, uh, thanks for keeping an eye on that. Um, good, um, and then, so then I can use conjunction, uh, K cents equals A prime. and A prime is greater than or equal to zero, and B is greater than or equal to zero. Uh, so that is uh, eight, nine, 10 by conjunction, and 12, uh, that's P of K, which is what we wanted to prove. All right, so then, so why, Yes, a prime would be greater than or equal to one. That's true, but it's if it's greater than or equal to one, it's also greater than or equal to zero. And what we need specifically is this. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. But uh, we, we need uh, to make our statement uh, true, we need this to be true, uh, which is, if you skip that step, uh, I would be fine with that. If you just said, um, a prime greater than or equal to one. I mean, it's as long as you're not, as long as it's clear, you know, you're not hiding too much complexity, then, then that sort of thing is fine. <clears throat> um, okay, any other questions? So why did we need four base cases? So it is a little misleading. It's because we wanted to do this P of K minus four. Now, if we had skipped any base cases, if I'd only said, say, proven P of 12 and P of 13. Yeah, we needed four because it's four cents. Otherwise, we would have left holes, right? So if I only proved these two, then it wouldn't have worked for P of 14 or P of 15. And then it wouldn't have been true for all of them. So strong induction is not, you know, it's not a silver bullet. You, you still have to sort of pay attention to what uh, to what's going on, but uh, it does. If you try to prove this without strong indu induction, it's uh, it's actually much 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 longer. Um, this is actually quite simple. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Um, all right. So we're going to take a break here. Uh, so we're going to when we come back, we're going to do this. This is again related sort of to the assignment, but it is sort of a long proof. So I want everybody to be a little bit fresh when we go through it. And then uh, if we have time after that, we we'll probably have a little bit of time, we can start sequences and sums. But, uh, so 644, let's 645, let's say we come back at uh, 655. All right.
All right, uh, so we're back. So this example here is not actually a proof by induction, it's a proof by contradiction, um, but it will help you out on the, uh, one of the questions on the, uh, on the assignment. So we're gonna, we're gonna go over it. I just didn't wanna do it first thing because it's, it's long and it's a bit of a grind. Um, so yeah, is there any questions on the, uh, the old material before we start? And uh, also, can everyone hear me okay? Perfect. Okay, <clears throat> so we're gonna prove that root six is an irrational number and we're gonna use a proof by contradiction. Uh, so we're gonna assume root six is rational. Uh, that is, we can write root six as a over b for integers a and b. Um, the other thing that's gonna, you're gonna see in this is using lemmas. Um, so lemmas are, um, we talked about how to make a, a deduction, how you have a bunch of arguments and sub-conclusions. These are basically sort of an official name for sub-conclusions. So they're little things that we want to use in our, um, in our main proof. Uh, what is it doing? Conclusions. Yeah, we can return to the tile example after this for sure. Um, if I forget, just remind me. Um, yeah, okay. All right, so we're gonna use a proof by contradiction. So uh, we're assuming that root six is rational. And, and what it means to be irrational is that you cannot write it as, uh, you know, A over B for some integers A and B. And that has the implication that uh, irrational numbers have infinite uh, number of decimal places. <clears throat> um, without, you know, without repeating. So that's, uh, anyway. Um, if you wanna learn more about ra rational and irrational numbers, we can, uh, we can talk after. But, um, so our assumption, since we're doing a proof by contradiction is that root six is rational. And that is our assumption. And what that means is that we can write root six as a over b and uh, a over b is in its lowest form, which means that there's no common divisor uh, for a and b. So uh, no common divisor. Okay, and that is a uh, definition of rational. All right, and then we can do three root six equals a over b, that is uh, two in simplification. And then we can just apply a little bit of math to that. So we get, if we take the square of both sides, we get six is equal to a squared over b squared. And that's simply three and some math. We square both sides. You don't have to, when you're writing proofs and that, you don't have to put in these details. If you just put math, as long as it's you know relatively clear, then uh, that, that's good enough. Uh, five, so we can do a little bit of algebra, multiply both sides by b squared, and we get six b squared equals a squared, so that's four in math. And now we want to let x equal 3b squared. And uh, 6 
a squared equals uh, two times x. Okay, and that's simply five in math. <clears throat> and so what that means is that a squared is even. And that's just the six and the definition of even. Okay, um, so everybody with us so far? Any questions? Okay, so now here's where the, these lemmas come in. So a lemma is just basically a separate proof, a smaller proof that, uh, that we need for our larger one. So technically you don't even need these, um, but they're a way to keep your proof organized, right? So it's not strictly necessary. Um, you could just make it a whole jumble, but um, similar to when you're writing programs and you make methods to handle things, uh, that's what lemma is. It's like sort of like a, a method method from a program. <clears throat> Just helps keep things organized. So our lemma is if a, a squared is even, then a is even. So that's what we want to prove. And to prove that, we're going to use the contrapositive. Because if we don't, if we start with a squared and try and go to a, well, then we got to take square roots and those are a pain. Um, but if we take the contrapositive, then if a is odd, then a squared is odd. So we can go from a to a squared and it's much easier to work with. Everybody clear on this step, why this is the contrapositive and, uh, and what we're doing here? Is there any questions? Okay. <clears throat> so we start with the assumption that a is odd. So then two, a is equal to two k plus one our definition of odd one. Um, so then we can look at a squared equals 2k plus one squared. And uh, we've seen this uh, before in our, in our lectures, 4k squared. And that's just two math let k prime equal 2k squared plus 2k and then we can say uh, 4 a squared equals 2k prime plus 1 Uh, yeah, why can't we try a is even if, uh, if a, a is even, then a squared is even. Well, we want to prove this. So then if a is even, then a squared is even, is what? This is, uh, Yeah, that's not the contrapositive. That's correct. This is actually the converse, right? Is that, did somebody get that? That's the converse, correct. So, and that's not, this is not logically equivalent. So if this is true, equivalent, it doesn't necessarily tell us anything about whether our original statement is true. But however, this is logically equivalent so yeah, so if that's true, then we can say, if this is true, then we can definitely say that this is also true. So yeah, contrapositive is, is a nice little trick that you can use, especially when you're doing these squares and stuff. Um, okay, and then five a squared is odd. The definition of odd. Okay, so we've proven lemma one. So now we have this, we have a new fact that we can use in our uh, knowledge base. Okay, so then uh, what number are we at? Eight. 
So back here up at seven, we said that a squared is even, and lemma one is that if a squared is even, then a is even. So what we can declare here is that a is even, and our explanation is lemma one, okay? And uh, modus ponens, I suppose, if you want, but you don't need to put that. Um, okay, so that's that's basically how you use a lemma. Um, so now we can say a is equal to 2k. That's uh, 8 in the definition of even. Ten. Um, six b squared equals a squared. So now that's equal to. Well, let's might as well put that down. So that's five nine in math. Five being, if I did it correctly, this guy here. So six b squared equals a squared. Um, so then 11, 6b squared equals 4k squared, uh, which is 10 in math, and 12, uh, 3b squared. If we divide both sides by 2, 2k squared, 11 in math, uh, divide by 2. Okay, so now what we want to show is basically that we want to show that B squared is even. So we know that A squared is even, um, and A squared is even implies A is even. What we want to show now is that B squared is even, and how we're going to do that is by using this lemma two. So if we show that B squared is even, then we'll know that A is even and B is even, and that tells us that AB is not in its lowest form, and then we can form our contradiction from there. So that's sort of the, the overview of what we're doing, why we're doing this part. Um, but first, we got to prove this. So this lemma two. Um, let me see here. So I originally wasn't going to cover this, and then uh, so in the supplemental, the proof is a lot more complicated. But then I figured out a simpler way to do it, so we're gonna we're gonna do this part. Um, so if d is even, so what did we do here? So in this step, we did um, implication equivalence. right? But I didn't do only implication equivalence. What else did I do? So how did I get, I took this and I got to here. Yeah, so I also did De Morgan's, that's correct. So I did De Morgan's on uh, the negation of this first of the antecedent. Okay, so now I have D is even, D times E is odd or E is even. And so that's an equivalent expression to what we're trying to prove in this lemma. Um, so now we can actually uh, just move the terms around. This is by, um, what do you call this, commutativity. So all I did to get from one to two is I moved, since these are all disjunctions, I can put them in any order that I like. It doesn't matter what order I do them in. Um, so I, I've moved them around. And then I did, from two to three, I did implication equivalence. And let's just be De Morgan's up here and also De Morgan's again down here. We absolutely need a second limit to prove this since two. 
from step 12. Yeah, I mean, so the question is, do we absolutely need a second lemma to prove this since 2k squared is even? Isn't it obvious that b squared is even from step 12? Uh, it is, I mean, you sort of know it, right? You sort of realize intuitively that uh, if since three is odd, that means uh, b squared must be the even part, right? Um, yeah, but we're just proving it. We're sort of demonstrating lemmas uh, and how you use them to sort of supplement uh, what you're doing. Even times. Even times any numbers, even. Yeah, even times. Yeah, that is true. Uh, even times a number equals even. Um, But we're saying that if three is odd, then b squared must be uh, even. So an odd number times an odd number is an odd number, correct? Odd times a number, yeah. So we're showing basically that um, if, if these both were odd, then this must be odd. Actually, that might even be an easier way to prove it. But since, um, since this is even, this, uh, this final thing, then at least one of these must be even. Because an even number times anything is, a, is an even number. Are we going to have to come up with lemmas like these ourselves? Eventually. In this class, though, um, we're going to tell you which lemmas you need to come up with. So we, uh, as in the assignment, um, we tell you explicitly, <laughs> oh, yeah. We tell you explicitly which, which lemma you need to use and how. And it should be sort of clear from this example how you would apply it. Um, in the future, you would use them. And again, it's not. You should feel like you have to. Uh, there, you use them basically to organize your proofs. If you're writing proofs, uh, they can help organize. <clears throat> right? You just come to something like this where it's like, well, this is going to be more complicated than I expected, so maybe I'll prove it in a separate lemma so that everything stays. Uh... Yeah. No, you come up with the whole thing yourself. No, that's... I mean, and that's a valid point. Generally what happens is if you're trying to prove something, and this is a, a little off topic, I guess, but or maybe not quite off topic. Um, you just work at it and then you, well, you say, oh, okay, I think I can prove this. And then you start proving it. And then you see, whoa, this proof is longer than I expected. And then you just start breaking it down. Um, yeah, no, this is, this is an introduction to these topics. So you don't have to come up with it at this point. Um, 2804, I think you start to you start to get into proofs, but even then, um, uh, we tend to walk you through them. Uh, we don't let you get lost. Um, the 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 steps that you have to take are usually pretty clear. The final exam is just as good as these assignments. Um, the assignments are are, I mean, they're harder than any quiz you're going to take, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the assignments are, are sort of meant to be that hard. And I mean, a final exam, I have to test you on everything in two hours. I can't, I can't really, and especially these proofs are hard to do in multiple choice, which is why this next quiz is not multiple choice. Um, but yeah, and generally speaking, anything you have to prove is gonna be, is gonna be super simple on a, on a quiz. Yeah, this is a this is a long, complicated proof, and it's sort of. I guess it should feel a little overwhelming at first, and then hopefully by the time you're done your assignment, you you feel a little more confident in, in your ability to do these things. Um, yeah. All right. <laughs> then we're right on track. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Good. Um, well, hopefully, uh, yeah, like I said, by the time you've done your assignment, hopefully you, you feel you feel a lot more confident. <clears throat> um, so now we have this expression here that we want to prove that's logically equivalent to this one. And it's, uh, so if D is odd and E is odd, then D times E must be odd. And that's sort of what we, actually, we were just talking about that uh, when we were looking at these guys up here. So uh, that's fairly simple to prove. Um, 
Uh, where is it? Oh yeah. So we're going to cheat a little bit here. I'm just going to do a reveal for you instead of. Right. So then, so this is what we're trying to prove here. Um, so then we assume that the antecedent is true. And then, so we can simplify that. So now we have D is odd. And then, so that means D is equal to two times K plus one, which is the definition of being odd. And then E is odd also by simplification. And then we do something similar to that. So now we have these two, we have D and E in their odd states. And then, uh, well, at this point, it should sort of be clear that we're gonna multiply them together. This is, um, hopefully it's clear. I mean, we've done it uh, a few times at this point. Uh, so we multiply them out and we get this, and then we can take, oops, take these guys and take out two as a common factor. And then, uh, so yeah, now this is some integer that we can put into another variable, k prime. So d equals 2k prime plus one by math, and then d e is odd by the definition of being odd. Okay, is there anything there that's not clear or you guys didn't get? I would hope, so this is, something like this would be the hardest thing that we would ask you on a quiz. Um, to prove that the, the product of two odd numbers is odd. We might ask you lemma two on a quiz. Um, but uh, probably nothing more complicated than that. Okay. <clears throat> So then what does that tell us? So lemma two is proven. Um, so we have 13, oops. Yeah, my pen sometimes does that. So three B squared is even. That's by 12 and the definition of even. You know that three is odd. That's sort of just math. Um, but now given lemma two, we know that, um, well, we know three B squared is even and three is odd. So 13, 14, conjunction. Um, so then we know that B squared is even. And that's by 15 and our lemma two that we put. <clears throat> and then if we know B squared is even, uh, yeah, so they're all hiding there. If we know B squared is even, what do we know about B? Is anybody, let's see, let's see if anybody's following still. We can use lemma one, right? So we could say that B is even. Yeah, B is even, exactly. Um, so that's 16 and lemma one. Eighteen, A is even, and B is even. It's eight, seventeen, conjunction. And then a, so I'm going to get a little bit informal here. 
are divisible by two. In the interest of not dragging this out even, even further. So definition of even. So that means A over B is not in its lowest form. And then we can take the conjunction not and A over B is in lowest form. And so that gives us what? So these two things are sort of opposites, right? It means one must be true, one must be false. So then true and false is false. And we have our contradiction. Okay. And that's, so that's the entire proof. And it's, yeah, it, it should feel a little bit like deep waters. Um, but uh, so there is um, uh, a copy of this on uh, Discord and on CU Learn. Uh, Lemma 2 is a little bit different. It's much more complicated there. But uh, you can just ignore that. Um, uh, but use it for a reference uh, when you're doing your assignment, definitely. Uh, for the assignment, we have root, uh, so root 75. And then should we ration, rationalize it to 3 root uh, 5 first? Yeah. 75. So yeah, you, you're going to have to break it down to root three times something, uh, which should be sort of the easy, easy part of it. Um, okay. Any other questions on that? Yep. All right. I'll give you a, a minute to, uh, Yeah, no problem. I think that's it for that's it for this proof, and that's it for induction. Like I said, there's two. Uh, ah, yeah. So I just a over b not part. So I just just running out of space. So not in lowest form. and AB is in lowest form. So these are basically two things that are uh, opposites, right? Yeah, no problem. Okay, square tiles example, yes. So I did that sort of informally too, so let's, And I mean, maybe it's that uh, this is not a, maybe I didn't explain the, the problem well enough. So the problem is um, they have a courtyard, it's a square courtyard, um, and they have a statue and they want to tile the rest of the courtyard. So basically we want some, some size courtyard, and in fact, it's going to be some power of two, so two to the K times two to the K. We want to put a statue. We can put it anywhere we like. So that's our statue. And then we want to tile the rest of the courtyard with pieces that look like this. Okay, so this is uh, uh, two by two by one by one by one. Okay, so the tiles are L-shaped um, and they're uh, three meters squared. And the statue is one meter squared. And then, so our base case, um, we can put the statue, since we can put the statue anywhere we like, we just put the statue down. Uh, we use one L-shaped tile, and then we end up with this square courtyard that contains the statue. And uh, yeah, so the pharaoh or the king or whatever is, is happy. 
um, in the base case. So he knows he's convinced that we can do it or she or whoever is convinced that we can, we can do it in a, if it, the courtyard is small, but now the, the ruler wants us to prove that we could do it when the courtyard is big. Um, but we're, we're telling them that, okay, we can do it when it's big, but it has to be the side lengths of the, of the courtyard has to be in meters, uh, some power of two. So again, this is um, inductive step let's say that uh, we can write it in the same old form that we uh, that we were using before. So P of K implies P of K plus one. So what that means is that assume we can tile a two to the K by two to the K meter courtyard um, with one space missing and that contains ostensibly the statue but then in our inductive case it also contains uh, a piece of tile okay so is the inductive hypothesis clear so we're going to assume this. So this is P of K right here. And then P of K plus one is show we can tile a two to the K plus one by two to the K plus one meter courtyard with one space missing. Okay, so is the argument clear? Okay, good. So now we can, so we're assuming P of K and we wanna use that to show that P of K plus one. And now the thing about P of K plus one is that the side lengths are twice, the side length of the K courtyard of P of K plus one is twice the size of the side length of P of K, right? So if we have uh, this P of K by P, uh, sorry, P to the K, who am I saying? Two to the K, oh my goodness two to the K by two to the K, and then we have with one spot missing somewhere, but we can choose where. Um, and let's say we have, so by our inductive hypothesis, uh, we can tile these. So we're gonna take four of them. Yeah, I keep. Okay, so we have four of them with one spot missing and, and by our inductive hypothesis, we're assuming that we can tile all of these. So what we're gonna do basically is we're just gonna shove them all together. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, well, since we can put that empty tile anywhere, we're gonna put them uh, right in the corner so that they meet. So then let's shove all these tiles together or all these courtyards together to one that's has a side length twice as big. So I'm going to draw them a little bit smaller because I'm running out of space. Now this is two to the power K meters here, and two to the power K meters here, two to the power K plus one meters in total, right? So is that clear how we get that side length? Okay, so now we can just, we put the statue here. 
So this guy is missing one, so we can do this by induction. And then we take one of these L-shaped tiles and we lay it across the other three uh, courtyards so that they're all missing one. So now I can, I can tile the rest of this by induction and the rest of this by induction and the rest of this by induction. Yeah. So yeah, that one, uh, it probably pays to, to take it a little bit slower with that one. Um, but yeah. Aha, uh -huh. yeah, okay. Yeah, so the last tile, uh, make sure that one spot is missing from, from all the other uh, inductive components, so to speak. Yeah, cool. Any other questions? All right. Who wants to start summations? <laughs> um, I have no problem. I have no problem stopping here for the night either. Um, because we are pulling a little bit ahead of where we're where we need to be. So um, who wants to uh, start on summations and who wants to uh, finish up? Neutral. Finish up. Yeah. Um, let me see what I got here. I might leave it at that for tonight. Um, oh, you want to keep on trucking? Sure. All right. We'll go. We won't do. Um, we'll do maybe half an hour more. Um, Good to finish up. Uh, I'll quickly. Uh, half an hour doable. Yeah, I mean, it's it's better for the pace of the course if I stop here, actually. Um, yeah, things are going because things are going quickly with uh, using the slides and everything. No, no, you don't need it for the assignment. You you have everything you need for the assignment. So uh, yeah, in terms of because if I we can pull ahead. Yeah, I can absolutely answer any questions you like. Yeah, uh, we can review the material. We can. Um, um, I might even be able to find more examples, although I'd have to sort of do it on the fly, but um, I, could, I, could, uh, I can do that as well. If you guys want to see more induction examples or uh, maybe I'll do that. So I'll do, um, yeah, let me quickly look up some induction examples and then uh, I'll do that. And then anybody else who, uh, you know, feel free to, if, if you uh, feel very confident in your induction, then, uh, you don't need to stick around for extra examples and yeah that's probably the best way to approach this okay so just give me uh, two seconds to find uh, some examples Okay, so I got, uh, so we're gonna prove that K cubed minus K is divisible by three. And uh, yeah, let's see, I'll do it on the fly, so maybe, uh, Maybe I'll even make a mistake, which is always interesting. Yeah. 
Yeah. Am I going too fast? Um, cause I can, I'm sort of, I'm easy going, uh, I can go slower by just making it so that I write things out and then that slows down the pace. Um, when I use slides, things tend to go faster. I guess it probably depends on the material. Right? Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, well, uh, the good news is you have the videos and, you know, I'm more than happy to, uh, because the, these lessons tend to be a little bit shorter. I'm more than happy to spend extra time helping people out. So, uh, uh even outside of office hours, if you, uh, you know, if there's no TA available, you can sometimes direct message me and, and I can answer your questions. Um, as long as that doesn't turn into a, a big, uh, too much of a, um, if there's too many people, then uh, I'd have to, of course, encourage people to see the TAs, but. Okay, good. Um, so we're gonna prove that N cubed minus N is divisible by three. So let me sure I, make sure I have the question correct. For all positive integers, okay. So for all n uh, greater than or equal to one, so we're going to prove this by induction. So again, uh, we in each case we always do the basis step. So what's the basis step? n equal to one, yeah. So we, we wanna show that um, n cubed minus n for n equal to one is divisible by three. So n cubed minus n is equal to one cubed minus one is equal to zero um, and zero is divisible by three, right? In the sense that there's no remainder. <clears throat> Okay, so that's our basis step, and then uh, our inductive step. So again, our inductive step is uh, almost always the same. So we're gonna show P of K implies P of K plus one. And you can always assume that unless I ask you specifically for strong induction. Um, All right, and so what this means is that, uh, so for our facts, our first assumption is P of K. This is our assumption. And that means that uh, K cubed minus K is divisible by three, and, and we're gonna write that as three times, um, I guess I can't use K here, I can use, three times J. So this is a definition of P of K. Okay, so this is divisible by three. <clears throat> okay, so now we wanna show that this is true for uh, K plus one. So let's see. So we're going to take a slightly different approach here. We're just going to, we're going to go straight to K plus one. Um, So we're going to just, we're gonna start with K plus one and we're gonna expand it out. And then at the end, uh, what we're gonna do is, is sort of plug this one back in, okay? So here we're just sort of, we're starting with PK plus one. We're not stating anything about this. So we're not saying this is divisible by three. We're going to prove that it is um, using 
the things that we know already. Okay. So does everybody understand what uh, what I'm doing here? What this what step three is? Or is there any question? Whoop. Okay. Good. So of course the next logical step is we're going to expand that out. Um, so I'm going to. I don't know off the top of my head what this is, so I'm just going to. Um, actually, what I'm going to do is go off to the side and evaluate it. So this is uh, k squared plus 2k plus 1. And then we want to multiply that times k plus 1 again. And that's equal to k cubed plus 2k squared plus k plus k squared plus 2k plus 1. It's 3k squared plus 3k plus 1. Okay. Is everybody comfortable with this? It's just algebra. It's a bit of tedious, but it's uh, so... Let's take this, copy it, no. All right, so that is equal to, um, Oh, uh, yeah, and then we got to subtract the k plus 1, yes, minus k plus 1. Good. All right, so then let's equals k cubed plus 3k squared. Uh, now we're going to subtract k and 1, so plus 2k. Uh, that seems okay. Is everybody okay with that? All right, good. So now here's the trick is we want to use our inductive hypothesis. So we want to use basically line number two. So we know that uh, k squared minus k cubed minus k is divisible by three. And actually, I guess we don't even need this part. We just need that it's divisible by three. So we're going to take uh, this k squared minus k away. So if we or k cubed, sorry, k cubed minus k. We're going to take that out as a separate term. And what that does is means we have to, so we're going to say minus k plus k, right? So we're adding k and then we're subtracting k. And so then we're taking this minus and combining it with this k cubed. And then that leaves us with 3k squared. And then this 2k plus k plus 3k. Okay, so anybody, is everybody comfortable with that or any questions? All right, so now what do we know? Well, this, we've deliberately taken that out and we know that it's divisible by three. And what do we know about this 3k squared plus 3k? Well, that's, I mean, we can rewrite this as Divisible by three also, yeah. And we know that because we can take out three as a common factor. And this is the definition of being divisible by K. Um, yeah, I can, uh, I'll post these as well, yeah. All right, so we've sort of informally uh, No, these math steps, you can sort of, uh, it's fine. It's clear if it's just algebra, that's, that's okay. Um, I don't mind if you combine them all into one, like one step like this. So all of this is sort of falls under the umbrella of step three. Um, so then, yeah, how would we write this now? 
P of K. Well, we know actually, I mean, at this point you can just say, um, yeah, four uh, K plus one, cubed minus k plus one is divisible by three. Um, let's see, I don't know. How would you formally write that? Actually, yeah. So how you should formally write this is, we put this 3j back in, then you can write this as uh, equals 3j plus three. And then we could say, let k prime equal k squared plus k, uh, 3k prime. equals three J plus K prime, and then let J prime equal J plus. And you can probably shorten this up into, yes. <clears throat> so yeah, and then we could say is divisible by three and that's by the definition of divisible by three. Okay, any questions on that one? Okay, you guys want another uh, example? I'll just do another example. And whoever wants to stay can stay. Um, just give me one second to find one. Where did I get the 3J? Um, I got the three J. Yeah, I probably should have. So at this point, um, I probably should have labeled this and then explained uh, So if I wanted to do it really formally, instead of sort of on the fly, I would do equals three J plus three K prime. And I would say that's by uh, two and uh, three and just simple, simple substitution. <laughs> uh, we won't be doing sequences today. I'm just gonna do more induction examples, yeah. Um, if we do, we, I mean, it's fine if we do sequences, but we are actually pulling ahead if we do that, which is not a problem either, but then at the end of the of the year, we'd have a class that we did nothing or something like that. So, <clears throat> and uh, in terms of induction, um, yeah, a lot of people need to, need repetition to sort of, to begin to understand what's going on on a lot of things. Number six on the assignment looks like a geometric series though. We won't need it. Uh, what's number six? Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, but I want you to use induction. That's the, technically you wouldn't need it, but um, uh, the idea is, uh, it is a geometric series. Um, yeah, good eye. It's a geometric series, so it should be easy to prove and it should be clear that it's already true, but I want you to, to uh, just apply induction on it and uh, prove that it's true. <clears throat> okay, uh, let's see what else we got for examples. Yep, 
Yeah, you don't need to know that to do the question. <clears throat> Um, okay, so I think we have, uh, let's try this one. This is a, uh, so I'm just taking examples from the discrete mass study center. So I'm, I'm running low because I've already taken a few examples from there, but uh, here's one about strong induction that's sort of a little less mathy, a little more, um, yeah, it, it sort of uh, gets the spirit of it. So we're, we have a game where there's um, two piles of matches. And there's two, two players. Okay, so they remove any number of matches they want from one of the two piles. So a player on their turn removes any number of matches from one of the piles. All right, so we just have a bunch of matches in a pile here and one pile of matches over here. Um, sorry, just let me, uh, just give me a second to, uh, Uh, yes. So the piles, the piles contain n greater than or equal to one matches each. So they have the same number of matches, um, some number greater than or equal to one. And we want to prove that well, the game is whoever whoever removes the last match wins. And we want to prove that player two can. So prove player two can always win. All right, so is the game clear? Are there any clarification of the rules that we need? So if, you, if there is, just let me know. Um, so our basis step or base case might be more appropriate since this is not really a step. We have n equal to one. So each pile has one match. All right, so then uh, it looks like this. Player one goes first, picks up that match. Player two picks up that match. Um, player two wins. And on the other hand, player one could pick up this match and then player two picks up that match. Again, player two wins. So in the base case, player two always wins. Okay, so any questions on that or? All right. Inductive hypothesis. Um, so if there are one less than or equal to J, less than or equal to K matches, uh, player two wins in both piles.
All right, so now that's, in a sense, our definition of P of K, and we want to show that, uh, or this is actually sort of P, sorry, P of J, and we want to show that P of K plus one. So sort of informally, what happens is that player one chooses at least one match from one pile. Player two chooses the same number of matches from the other pile. Now, both piles started with K plus one. Uh, that's so. This is by strong induction. So, if there are uh, one less than or equal to J, less than or equal to K matches in both piles, player two wins. That, that's that's really just sort of the uh, the definition. Um, that's sort of the definition of this P of J here. All right, so that's uh, similar to the strong induction question that we did earlier, where we did uh, uh, for the stamps, where we said, uh, what did we say? Was it stamps? Uh, or what was the other one? No, it was the stamps. So then for, um, yeah, 12 less than or equal to J less than or equal to uh, K. Actually, that's not how we wrote it, but it was it was something like that. Um, is that, sorry, is that clear now or maybe? Yeah, that's the, yeah, that's the strong induction. That's the definition of strong induction. Um, so yeah, at this point, so player one chooses at least one match from one pile. So now we have some, now this has J matches in it. So player two chooses the same number of matches from the other pile. So now this has J matches. Since he has to choose at least one match, um, J now falls within this range. Uh, from one, actually, if J is equal to zero, then player two has one. Otherwise, uh, J falls somewhere in this range, and then the inductive hypothesis applies. So now we know that uh, we're assuming that player two is going to win because uh, by induction. Um, there, that, I don't know if I explained that. Uh, that well, but is there questions on that or is that it's very sort of informal, uh, less mathy and, and maybe it's, it's sort of a, an algorithm that you can see in your head, right? Uh, whatever player one takes, player two just takes the same amount and then you can repeat that as many times as you want until both uh, get to zero. Um, so it's sort of an, a, a bit of a weirder example of, of strong induction, but um, yeah, uh, yeah. They can pick, yeah, player one chooses one pile and then player two can pick the same pile, but he, he just doesn't. That's not a winning strategy. Um, player two is going to pick from a, the winning strategy is player two picks from the, the opposite pile and picks the same number. Um, that's one winning strategy, right? Yeah, any other questions on that? Yes, that's correct. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, that's, um, and if you guys, um, so I don't have anything else prepared and I think I've uh, taken all the examples from the, well, I mean, there's more math examples, but I would like to, uh, if you guys want to do more example, uh, more examples of this, maybe we'll do that next week. I'll just prepare some uh, so that they can be, uh, yeah, so that I'm not flying by the seat of my pants and, and perhaps not explaining things as well as I could be. Um, but yeah, we can start next uh, next lecture with, uh, oh good. We can start next next lecture with a few more examples and then uh, move on to uh, sequences and sums. Like I said, we're uh, we're doing really well for time. So uh, more examples is uh, if it's helpful for you, it's uh, certainly helpful for the timing. So, um, and then when you do your review, then you know you can you can either zero in on the lecture or zero in on the examples, uh, whatever you like. Okay, so I think that's uh, we're gonna yeah for sure. So we'll stop there tonight and then, uh, so for next lecture, no problem. Uh, next lecture, I'll prepare a few more of those before we get into the, uh, and then uh, the sequences and sums, maybe I'll, um, since you guys like the, the examples, I'll add a few examples. I already have some examples, but I'll add a few more. Um, okay, so that's it for tonight and uh, I'll stick around for the next 10 minutes or so and answer questions, but uh, all right, thanks a lot everyone and uh, see you next week.